we're sitting here with the creators of the short film Il Fatas. Please introduce yourself. I'm Richard Franklin, director and co-writer of Il Fatas No Subtitles. I'm Rob Wickman, actor, uh, screenplay writer. Co-writer. Rob's... I remember, I remember an email that he sent. And one of the things that he said in the email, I don't know if this is a take-home message or anything about what we expect people to take from the movie, but one of the things he said, I think before he even sent the screenplay, is um, the concept of what or how you would feel if something that you thought was... Mm. Mm -hmm. Can you go for it, Eric? Repeat it. <laughs> it's like something that, that you think is... is Peaceful, beautiful, harmless. harmless, harmless. No, no, actually, okay, what it is, is because I just remember, this is based on Aki. Aki. On Aki. Yeah. Um, I, I might, we have time, so i just go ahead and just tell, tell the story. Yeah. Aki and I were going to a sushi restaurant, and uh, she went up to the counter, it's a Japanese restaurant, and she st started speaking Japanese to the cashier or the or the hostess and the hostess stepped back and was really looked really fearful and then they kept talking and talking and talking and then the hostess kind of went like oh okay you know and I could tell she was she Aki made her feel more at ease and I, I took her I said what, I was like, what did you say, what did you say to that girl you know she looked like she saw a ghost and, and she and she said her in her broken English and she, oh she she thought I was mafia <laughs> and I said, she thought you were a mafia. What do you mean she thought you were a mafia? And, and that happened because Aki, the way Aki dressed all the time, she dressed, she had this hoochie fabulousness. She would dress in the highest heels, the shortest skirts, hair was blown out. She was, she was, she was hot. And I love that, but people would look at her and even gangsters would be like, damn. You know, and she would just kind of look at him and just, you know, give that look like, don't even think about messing with me. And at home, she was the cutest, sweetest, nicest, playful person that would never hurt a fly. Never. And even when we're at the restaurant, even though, you know, she has this Japanese mafia accent because she's from Hiroshima. And the cashier person thought that, okay, here's the, here's the Yakuza coming in with their with their their girl the lookout to take over the restaurant and she just assured her no I'm not I'm not in the Japanese mafia I'm just a girl and so that got me thinking if anything can you could take from this is that if you can think of something that is the hardest most lethal thing that you could possibly think of when you see it and then when you get to know it it's actually very gentle and very sweet and that's the whole crux of El Fatis. Right. You and see these assassins. And there's guns, which of course right. is danger. But as, as our flyer said, and even some of our posters said, they don't kill you. They don't kill you. This, this film actually bridged two law firms. I, I was doing the consulting work at Foley, and then I went to Brobeck. Right. But I was around all of these people where every day I heard screaming, I would see people crying. I mean, it was insanity. And so Rob sends this thing of these two workers going about their job, and I like the fact that um, basically they're not exactly happy when they're working. And one of the reasons why it's going to be fun to do a feature is that in the feature we actually do give you a couple of moments where you get to see these two in between contracts, you know, where they're kind of not dealing with their everyday routine because um, their job has gotten harder. Uh, if you watch the movie, you'll see that it's a different time and era. You, you have to do what they do right. to do what they do. Right. And so I, I fleshed that out. Now, I can remember talking to you about all that. And you were like, what? <laughs> like, you, you know, whatever you see, I, you were like, because I, I, what he saw is what gave the movie legs. And I basically say I added a, maybe a torso and some arms. And you can't walk without legs. So he gave the legs, and then I, I saw other stuff that I thought was relevant to, especially to the time period. And what's cool is it's still relevant today, right now, to do a, a movie about these, these disgruntled workers, for the most part, these disgruntled employees. <clears throat> During the filming of this movie, 
Where, what was it like? Was, was there any uh, mishaps, adventures? The first, the first scene was shot, again, in an office where I was working. Uh, we had storyboard the, the movie, just the other people. If you don't want to go through the process of drawing a lot of times your storyboards and you know your potential locations, what I'd done is I'd taken a bunch of pictures. And it was with the pictures that we were able to see where we wanted the characters to walk and how we wanted them to behave. Um, I think the only place we really weren't able to storyboard was Brandon Melendez's house because I had never seen it before. Um, so that was really, really shooting off the off of the cuff. But we knew what we wanted to see, um, <clears throat> and so that was that was the first part that was fun was literally location scouting, and then storyboarding based on the screenplay and the locations. Um, we actually had people come here to this house. Uh, Rob and Aki, we've got great footage of them sitting actually back there where we're going through their, their actual costumes. Um, at first we were going to have Aki wear white and there was something that we just didn't like about the way the two characters looked when she was wearing white and he was wearing all black. But we, we, we did all of that, had them working out in the truck, um, going through their scenes in the truck. It's funny because I was watching it and it's got, I don't know if you remember this, but it was a song, Pasta, what it is, right? you know that song? Rolling. Action. Ring, ring. What the? Mush, mush. That's playing, and then Naki turns it down because remember, and then you give her the look. Right. So what we did all that here. Um, the, the it's a day in their life, and so the, the progression of time also was important. And so we did a um, one of the shots, which is the shot with the punks, is actually done at between four and five in the morning on a weekday. <clears throat> the driving scene was shot in a part of town called Bankers Hill. Actually, you could almost say right after rush hour. It was it was dark, but it was a, a part of town where there's not a lot of traffic, which turns out to be good because Aki apparently couldn't see to drive. This was the nighttime scene, right? That's the nighttime yeah. scene. Yeah, that was Aki wasn't fit to drive, but there was no one for her to hit. Thank God. Um, Jason's scene was again it was a nighttime scene, and and of, we, because we were doing this on the zero budget. I mean, we lit it with construction lights. There, there are aspects, especially of the dark scenes, that, that, that still kind of rub us wrong because we really wish we could have lit them better. And I had to do a lot in post that I didn't know how to do, which is, you know, jack up the illumination and things like that. And that was, that was weird. And I, that, that could lead to why I had such a weird feeling about the movie. Uh, it's only recently that I really started to realize that regardless of how I feel, I have to look back at it and say, we shot a digital video when no one was shooting digital. The only person at the time who was even talking about it was being scoffed constantly, and that's Lucas. Everyone was like, you're out of your mind, you think you're going to shoot digital, and he was like, that's where it's going. And so that we, we, we pulled it off, for lack of a better word. We literally did pull it off, because with all of that involved, I mean, the, when, when, when the Sarah character, Aki, when she grabs April by the neck and lifts her up, we actually have like fun footage of where we were first you know, working on this lever that literally somebody would have to stand on to lift April into the air and make it look like Aki was lifting her up. I mean, we had to go through all of that. We had to figure all of that out. And the guns, we wanted them to have guns, but, you know, I didn't want them to have, like, a Glock or something common. I wanted it to kind of fit in with the character. These are, these are timeless characters, so they have a gun that's literally a timeless gun. From what, what year is that gun? That's a 1600s gun. From I the 1600s. Yeah, with yeah. the three barrels. And and when we shoot the feature, you should see the new gun. <laughs> wow. Uh, what kind of equipment did you guys use in the making of this film? At the time, we were working with a computer. In 2001, we were working with a computer I think I might have bought in 97, when I still was living in Philly, going to school. So it was, it was four to five years behind the technological curve. Um, we're not talking about me working on any Pentium. I mean, this was when that word was kind of new. RAM-wise, we didn't have a lot of RAM. Um, in the shooting scene, I, I had, I mean, you remember this is almost 10 years ago. I, I just recently remembered that in the shooting scene, in the car, shooting the scene in the car, um, we actually used a fishing flashlight, a big blue flashlight to light that scene and while it was dark 
I, I would say that it probably was the best way to shoot a driving scene because it was one of the few driving scenes I've ever seen where it doesn't look like they have like an overhead light on in their car. Um, we, we made dolly tracks out of uh, literally plywood with strips of wood that this, this dolly that we had, this tripod that we had, happened to have wheels and you could put two wheels in tracks and then move it. And at the very beginning of the movie, you, <laughs> you can actually see where, we're, where the, the first pan opens and it, it comes by and then at the very end you'll see it kind of bounce. That's because we ran off of the dolly track. And, you know, it would have been worth a second take, but it actually looked cool with um, the music that we were using to score it because it was kind of like at that point we ratcheted up the music. Um, what else? We, we had a literally a broom mic. It was a $12 uh, Radio Shack microphone attached to a broom handle and taped on. Uh, because of that, the sound is not exactly what we like. Right. But, but um, it, it was weird. We, we were smart enough. We were smart enough to make a movie at a time when people weren't shooting digital movies, shooting on video, and make something that was competitive enough to win some awards. And we also... Uh, we also had to improvise in terms of sets, in terms of where we were. We, we used, I think, where you were at Foley. Uh, we, used, we, went, we, had, we used the office at Foley and Lardner for the first scene. Right, we used the office at Foley and Lardner, and we came in on probably on a Saturday or Sunday. Actually, believe it or not, it was a holiday, too. I forget what weekend that was, because it was a holiday. Right. Um, but, yeah, we went in when no one was in the building. Right. Yeah. And then the we happened to have a Land Rover. So that's the car. I was going to scenes. mention the Land Rover. Yeah, we had, we had that, which was good for them to have. Um, at the time, I had a, a green 914, which seemed perfect for the punks to have. Plus, we could take the top off, right. which means we could film what they're doing in the car without the top being down. And then we had a friend named Jason. I always forget his last name. St St Perry? Uh, Terry? Jason. Um, I forget his name. Yeah, Jason. But Jason <laughs> had a, a cute house down in... Um, in the Ocean Barry, Beach area. Jason, Jason Barry. Barry. Yeah. 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 He, he, had a, he had a sweet house down in the Ocean Beach area that, that had stairs to go up to what we make in the movie what appears to be a room. You go up the stairs and go to a bedroom. But really, you went upstairs to nothing um, except a balcony on the outside. And then the, the, the kids' room was literally the kids' room. It was the kids' room. <laughs> we got... Uh, well, we're, Brandon's room. We're going to talk about casting later. But we, but we used two houses... We had two separate houses. Right. Right. An office. An office. Right. And then, um, I forget the corner, but there was a street corner in downtown San Diego that always intrigued me when I moved in town because it had this big airplane sticking out the top of it. And I'm happy that we did the movie because that airplane is gone. And so I'm like one of the few people that has that still on tape, which is this, this blue airplane sticking up out of the... It was actually uh, sixth and great. Sixth and great? Yeah. There you go. I used to live, I lived right down... You the, lived right around the corner. corner. Yeah, I know. Uh, you you mentioned a few names. Uh, how did you go about casting the the roles that were? I actually will put casting on him and um, April. I I actually had to trust what him and April said was going to be okay. I I had zero to do with casting. All I ever said was okay if you think they're going to work. <laughs> well, I, I I have to say this. Um, I don't know if she if she's going to see this, but the whole the whole movie is is basically based on um, Aki. The, the uh, female lead in, in the movie and of course there's nepotism because I was dating her at the time but she was just so she was an amazing human being and, and he promised me that she would pull it off yes I did I knew she would be able to do it she, she's from Hiroshima in Japan with all that history with the, with the war and the atomic bombing she come Hiroshima is a Japanese mafia hub and she comes from that, even though she's not gangster. And I knew immediately from the effect that she had on people, on other Japanese people around her, and on gangsters that we would meet in the street, how they would treat her and how she was not, had no fear of anyone at all. And of course her look was disarming. I knew that she had to be first, she had to be cast, that she had to be in this movie because she brought so much and she pulled it off like crazy. Substance to the to the, to the role. You can actually you believe her. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's it, the, the funny thing about the Aki casting is that in the end, when I go back and look at, at some of the raw footage, it's amazing that she could do seven takes as a non-actress. She could do seven takes, and in every take, 
she really seems like she's there in that moment. And for her to be able to take every moment by moment was great. It was really funny, actually, because, I mean, she acted that one night when we were in the car. She was acting so serious and doing what she was supposed to be doing that it was after maybe 10 or 15 minutes, and it was dark outside, that she asked us to wait because she couldn't see because it was too dark and she had on sunglasses. And, of course, the rest of the people in the car, me, April, and Rob, were like, you can't see and you're driving. And she's driving. <laughs> <laughs> And I don't know how far we drove. No, man, we were going up another street. Like, at least, it had been at least 10 minutes of a week could have crashed. Rosendo, who plays um, Lance Horta, one of the punks, was a, um, a gift from April, who was working on a pilot at the time and happened to meet Rosendo. Or maybe I should say, Rosendo happened to meet April. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and he was. He came to the house, and we did a quick, like, test shooting, and he was perfect. Within the first 30 seconds, I was like, you know what? He's going to be fine. He's amazing. Yeah. He's and actually amazing. I actually hope he's doing okay. Last, I, I won't even say last time I heard from him what, what he was going through. And then John Hall literally was a dude I met in the copy room, and he pretty much served his purpose in that um, he's kind of just there. And... The only moment that we actually got out of John in the movie was kind of coaxed out of him after a while. We got him, we got him to laugh, and then I'm like, okay, now why are you laughing? Say your line. We got him to say his line, and then we went back to Rosendo, who is is a good actor. He's a good actor. Pete Klein, who plays him, the guy who gives the car to um, Jaron right. when at the very beginning of the movie. Pete has just been around actors for so long that my bet is that if if Pete was given a real role, Pete Pete actually can act. April is an actress. I met her um, in Philadelphia, quite honestly, because I saw her in a Lorraine Hansberry play where she played all the characters in a couple of monologues, and she she's she's an actress, so it was no problem. And, with her. and please and please <coughs> mention more nepotism because I was. I was married to her, I believe, at the time. Or, or we got married during the time. So there's more nepotism. Or it was more us letting people see, we date fine women, all right? And then, <laughs> and the other part, the other, the last character, which is um, Brandon Melendez. Yeah. He was someone that Rob worked with. He was my co-worker's son. son. And he fit because he looked like April could have given birth to him. That's true. And he's half Puerto Rican. Uh, half Texan, Texan, right. pure. In other words, pure San Diegan. Right. And um, he, he, we didn't. We just purposely didn't give him a lot. I mean, we thought about it. You know, we, we really didn't give our our questionable actors or actresses. We didn't give them a lot to do. Aki was just amazing. What she pulled off was really rare. So again, we're available, big time. We're right here in San Diego, California. Not that you can, you can find us. And we ain't stuck here either. That's right. So if you need us to go to Oklahoma. Tonight we, we are going to screen two movies. Uh, the first one, Il Fatas, no subtitles, directed by Richard Franklin, Richard A. Franklin. And uh, we have a couple of awards to present, Richard. Uh, two awards here at the film festival. The first one is for Best Experimental Short Film. Mm-hmm.